The following is a production of Phoenix Media. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the company or its advertisers and may contain language that's unsuitable for younger listeners. You're listening to Be Kind Rewind with Tim Nidell, taking you back to when movies were actually good. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? When music wasn't auto-tuned. When TV only had a few channels. And now, here's your host, Tim Nidell. Well, hey guys. Welcome to a brand new episode of Be Kind Rewind with your host, Tim Nidell, which is me. So as you know, Be Kind Rewind is all about going back to the good old days, going back when movies were awesome, music was actually good and not auto-tuned, and television was this huge event where we had to be there at a specific time to see our favorite TV shows. And for this episode, we are going all the way back to 1989, because I'm interviewing the voice of the Crypt Keeper himself from Tales from the Crypt, John Kassir. Ah! Now here is a story you can sink your teeth into. Tales from the Crypt was one of those shows where I definitely should not have been watching at the age of nine. I don't think I really started when I was nine. I think it was early 90s. You know, maybe I was like 11 or so. But we had HBO. I loved horror movies. You know, I grew up watching Friday the 13th on TNT. Of course, it was censored and everything. But if you catch it late Saturday night with Joe Bob Briggs, it wasn't as censored as, you know, watching it on afternoon. (laughs) So I grew up loving horror movies and I just loved Tales from the Crypt. And of course, the Crypt Keeper himself kind of Kind of made the show, honestly. He really did. I mean, had had amazing directors, producers, major and great storylines. But the host himself had to set up every episode, and I think the Crypt Keeper was the perfect choice for that show. And the voice that John Kassir chose for the Crypt Keeper was just amazing. And of course, we're going to be talking all about that and about some of his other voice work in my interview just coming up shortly. But before I play, make sure to go to my website, timnidell.com. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm posting weekly videos on there. Listen to my other podcast, Saturday Morning Rewind, where I interview voice actors that I grew up loving. Follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram. All of those links are on there, timnidell.com. I'd really appreciate it if you would follow me everywhere you know not i mean not everywhere but uh anywhere online at least but like i said let's go back to the year 1989 the year that tells from the crypt debuted on hbo and let's listen to my interview with the voice of the crypt keeper himself john kassir so let's let's start off to get to know you a little bit more what kind of a kid were you were you always in love with horror movies and and, and horror comics that kind of stuff well, you know, it's funny, um, in terms of Tales from the Crypt, um, I uh, used to collect the comic books. Uh, my grandfather had like a little store uh, as a side business, and there was a rack of comic books. And, um, you know, when my uh, cousins and I would, uh, you know, in the summer we'd go visit my grandparents, we'd uh, hike our way down to my grandfather's store, and he said, you, we could pick a comic book or, or a magazine from the rack. Um, you know, the Tales from the Crypt comic books, of course, were kind of taboo, and they'd be sitting up the top of the, mm-hmm. <laughs> the top of the rack. I'd climb up the rack and, <laughs> and get the Tales from the Crypt, sneak off with them. I actually probably even had a few stashed away that were uh, probably very collectible at this point, but I, um, I think my mom found them and, and um, <laughs> you know, uh, gave them to some kid down the street. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, when I came back after getting the part in Tales from the Crypt, I came home looking for them, thinking they would be very collectible, especially since I could sign them. <laughs> oh, it's so true. Yes, yes. And uh, and they were gone, and, uh, along with my Hot Wheels and my Matchbox cars, which were all my collectible <laughs> stuff. I was like, were you kidding me? She goes, oh, I gave them... When you were in college, I gave him to some kid down the street. I was like, no. I, I, I feel your pain. My parents did the same exact thing when I was 19 and I moved away. I was like, you know, I'm, I don't play with them, but it'd be nice to keep them. They're, they're all memories. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and very often, you know, highly collectible stuff, too. Exactly. Um, but uh, I loved 
I mean, they had a thing in Baltimore where I grew up. They had a, uh, uh, in the afternoons, uh, late afternoons, they had something called Twilight Movie. I think it was probably around 4 or 4.30 or something when my mother, in between when I came home from school, my mother was making dinner. So I would sit down and watch whatever they had. And they would play everything from, you know, Doris Day movies to Mothra, you know. and But they would always show, um, you know, at least, you know, one every couple of weeks or whatever, one of the Universal Horror Monster movies. Um, you know, whether it was Wolfman or um, even the comedies like uh, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Yeah. And these were these were definitely my favorite movies of the time. Um, I had uh, I remembered ordering from one of the one of the back of some comic book like a six foot cutout of Frankenstein that I had in the corner of my bedroom that. Um, because I remember seeing Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, and they find Frankenstein in like a a crate with you know all this packing, uh, um, you know shredded packing material, and I was like, you can order a Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> so then when I found out you actually could order one, but it was you know paper cut out, a cardboard cut out, you know, I ordered it and I uh-huh. had it sitting in the corner of my room, and uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and swear it was coming closer to me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so I, you know, I, I did love horror. I, I don't think I was ever, you know. Now I've I've grown a taste for you know well when they're well done slasher movies and that kind of thing. But I don't think that was that was really my deal. Uh, although I do remember some of the earlier ones and, and loving taking dates to go see, uh, you know, like Night of the Living Dead. And yes, when yes. They, when they, you know, Dawn of the Dead, they do those as uh, double features and stuff. You know, they they just close the doors and. Um, you know, they'd either show the William Castle movies, like The Tingler and stuff like that. Oh, and, so good, yes. Yeah, and they'd, they'd close all the doors and, you know, there'd inevitably be some guy tripping his ass <laughs> off on LSD, you know, down in the front of the theater, uh. <laughs> screaming at the screen, and people would be laughing at, the, like, his ridiculous comments or, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, uh, you know, I loved uh, back then that was something to get into, you know. Oh, my precious. Ooh, yeah, let me tell you something right here, uh huh. It's the Loot Crate subscription box, yeah, full of exclusive loot on surprises and delivered to your door every month. Just pick up your favorite geeky genre, daddy. Ha <laughs> From the original Loot Crate, the Loot Crate DX collectible boxes, dude. Cowabunga! To the Loot Gaming video game box. Woohoo! Oh. Wowzers! With crates starting as low as eleven ninety nine per month, those are facts just about for all collectors. To get your geek on, head over to phoenixmedia.us forward slash loot crate and claim your exclusive offer. That's f e n i x media dot us forward slash loot crate. Great Scott! Snap into a loot crate, dig it? WWE Superstar Alberto Del Rio. Take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE Superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. This is Mario Andretti. You know me as a race car driver, but I'm also a Meals on Wheels volunteer. I've raced against the sport's biggest personalities, but I've never met more vibrant, amazing people than the seniors served by Meals on Wheels. You can make a difference by dropping off a hot meal and saying a quick hello. So, America, let's do lunch. Volunteer your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. People been saying to your friend, get a different face. And posting on their feed, they're super ugly. The things they say to them online are cruel and they're not true. So tell your friend, I'll stand up for you. Don't worry, I know what to do. 
someone being bullied online, you can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool and by letting your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Now, I wasn't too familiar with the comic series of Tales from the Crypt. Was the Crypt Keeper a prominent role in the comics as well? Oh yeah, he was. He, you know, there was there were other characters there as well. Um, but the the Crypt Keeper always in, in the classic form of our show. Um, you know, our show really tried to capture the elements of the comic book in the way that it you know brought it across. And the Crypt Keeper would have um, he'd be up in the corner of you know, some of the little frames of the comic, you know, making his comments and, you know, there'd be a little bubble and uh, he'd be on the cover in little, you know, corners of the cover, um, you know, saying stuff like, hello, boils and ghouls, you know, I mean, that was taken right from the comic book. Nice. Um, so, and uh, he was also um, assisted by the vault keeper and uh, a character called the old witch. Um our Crypt Keeper, the way he was designed and um, the look and the feel of him, uh, Kevin Yeager had conceived as kind of a combination of those three characters. Um, he looked more like, uh, I think the Crypt Keeper in the comic books looked more along the line of, um, you know, an old man in a, in a hooded shroud, you know, something that was that uh, looked a little more human and not dead. Okay. But... Um, uh, I'm sure he probably was meant to be, you know, probably living dead, but uh, he, he didn't come off quite as much that way. Um, but that whole, you know, comedy tongue-in-cheek idea of him uh, was very much something that I knew uh, I wanted to bring to it when I was when I had the opportunity to audition for it. I was doing another series for HBO called First and Ten, uh, which was about a... Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, football team, and that was uh, HBO's first series. Um, starred uh, O.J. Simpson as the general manager. Really? Delta Bur- yeah. <laughs> Delta <laughs> Burke was the owner of the team. She had won a divorce settlement and um, was a pro team called the California Bulls. And over the years, we had all kinds of great people on there. They had all, all kinds of great football players that came on each week. And, um, and uh, we had... You know, people like Chris Maloney played the uh, Chris uh, Maloney played the quarterback one se- you know one or two seasons, and uh, Jason Begay was one of the quarterbacks for a couple of seasons, um, that kind of thing. But we also would have you know um, Ted Hendricks or some you know Joe Namath or Joe Montana or somebody come on and be a newscaster or you know a, a football player or an exec or something like that. So the show was full of uh, football. And um, I played uh, uh, the Bulgarian field goal kickers. I got Abshkinuski. <laughs> I could kick uh, 60-yard field goals. So I was uh, this little foreign guy who was let loose on America with all this money and fame and uh, no real sense of uh, cause and effect. So, um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I would, uh, you know, just walk up to two chicks and say, "Hey, I am Zagreb Skinuski. I play for the California Bulls. I fuck you both, yes." You know, and they get a drink <laughs> in my face. They'd be like, "You love me," you know. So it was, a, it was a really fun character, and I and um, I had also, uh, you know, not so many years before, I'd won Star Search as a stand-up comedian. Yeah, I saw that, that. Yeah, that kind of came to me in an odd way. Um, where I was doing an off-Broadway musical uh, starring myself along with Scott Bakula 
and a guy named Jerry Colker who wrote the piece. And uh, it was, I uh, think, Dream Girls for stand-ups. It's a musical, three stand-ups uh, alone. They're not so good together. They're 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 a big hit. Um, you know, in their whole life, uh, uh, you know, getting the spoils of Hollywood, going from New York uh, in these small clubs to Hollywood. And it was a big hit off Broadway, and I played a very dark, kind of untethered uh, comic, kind of in the vein of a of, um, of an Andy Kaufman kind of character. And, and uh, it, it launched a lot of uh, my career for me. Uh, people from Star Search in their first season saw me in the show and asked me to come on as a stand-up comic. And I said, you know, I'm not really a stand-up comic. It's the part I'm playing in the show. And they said, well, you can win $100,000. I'm like, oh! I'll do it. Can I tell you about my stand-up uh, material uh, <laughs> that I'm writing right now? <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, so I went on and I won uh, Star Search uh, doing bits that were would include, like, I do The Wizard of Oz in two and a half minutes, or I do, you know, um, you know, a salesman sending a, selling a three-in-one machine that I would become the machine and stuff like that. and. So kind of like Ernie Kovacs kind of stuff, if you know Ernie, Ernie Kovacs yeah, from back in the day. Yep. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so people knew me as this guy who did all these voices and characters and stuff. So HBO were like, hey, you know, we should have John come down and audition, you know, for Kevin. Um, Kevin Yeager was having the auditions at his studio. Um, you know, and you got to see the Crypt Keeper and that kind of thing. And I remember going down and seeing all these other you know, you know, some of the people were, you know, established actors and they had voiceover guys and they had some stand up comics and they probably had about when I was there, probably about, you know, a dozen, 15 different, um, you know, really talented people down mm-hmm. there. And I, I saw them looking at the copy, reading it, going, be careful what you ask for. You may get it, you know, and they're thinking, <laughs> you deliver this crap is like, you know, they didn't get it, but no. having you know, growing up with the comic books and that kind of thing, I was like, you guys don't get it. He loves saying this, you know, uh-huh. loves saying uh-huh. it. So, you know, and from what I saw physically of the character, um, you know, I went in to Kevin's office where he had a little uh, makeshift recording set up for me to record with. And, um, you know, I started entertaining him as the grip keeper and some of the copy they had written and then, uh, improvising a little bit on my own. And and then I found myself, as he was getting into it, I found myself laughing at my own jokes, uh, you know, uh, as the Crypt Keeper, uh-huh. and then just breaking into this cackling, you know, Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz laugh, you know. And he was just, like, shaking his head going, yeah, 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 let's give, give me more, you know. And the next day he had me doing it for Joel Silver and... and, and um, uh, Richard Donner in their office. Wow. And, uh, they were like, oh, we love this. This is great. We'll see you on the set. You know, and that was, the rest was history with that. So, um, you know, it was uh, a lot of my love for it and also some, you know, strange circumstances that brought me there. Um, you know, you do a, you work in this business for, uh, in my case, 36 years, uh, supporting myself as an actor and <clears throat> you know if you have one thing that people even remember i mean i've done a, a number of tv series that you've probably never even heard of including my own kid show on the usa network called johnny time which was uh really really great and really a lot of fun to do but short-lived what year was that um, um, uh, 97 okay okay eight so i would have yeah. been in high school then yeah it was. It it actually wound up being like a, a show that was that went over really big with kids and stoners. It was, it was, kind, of a, <laughs> it was kind of a psychedelic kid show that uh-huh. I did for the USA Network. Um, it was going to be the flagship for their children's programming on Saturday and Sunday mornings, and um, I, they wound up with some kind of legal battle over who owned the network um, between two different studios and. The studio that I came in with was not the one that that was that was winning that legal battle. <laughs> so they didn't they didn't uh, they didn't have really any money to create any children's programming other than what they had already shot of my show. So we went up like the only kids show on the USA wow. Network. So we were the lead into the WWF on Sunday mornings. So <laughs> <laughs> wow, 
Interesting. <laughs> up being this really <laughs> crazy kid show. It's like TV Guide, you know, featured us in their in their you know their yearly children's programming guide is like the be- your best kid show on TV and that kind huh. of thing. But you know, you're not going to without a block of kids programming, you're not going to really yeah. get a lot of attention exactly. for it. Exactly. So, um, every once in a while, somebody will write me on Facebook or something about how they love Johnny Time and where they can they get copies and stuff, and how they they had recorded it and their kids are addicted to it and that kind of thing. It was a it was a really really great show. I got to hire all my friends and you know I played all the characters except the kids that I would pull through the TV set that would be on my show. But um, it was uh, it was you know just had a real psychedelic kind of feel to it and. Um, uh, I think it could have been, you know, it could have been like a, you know, the next Pee Wee's Playhouse or something if it had yeah. uh, gotten its light. But I should probably put it on YouTube. Oh, that point. would be amazing! I would love to see that. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty wacky, uh, pretty wacky show. Um, but I think Mike Myers with his own kid show. You know, that kind of <laughs> feel nice. Yeah, but. Um, so, you know, th- that's the kind of stuff that I got to do uh, over the years. And here, you know, Tales from the Crypt is the thing that people have still have gravitated back towards and that still has a audience. And, um, you know, for years uh, after Tales from the Crypt was, was off the air, people were still watching it. But I thought it was still just the adult audience that originally had seen the no, show. No, no, no. And, you know, didn't realize till I started, you know, being, you know, asked constantly to come to some of these horror conventions, um, which I love going to just for my own uh, enjoyment of the of the whole scene. Um, you know, how how many kids grew up with Tales from the Crypt? Because uh, if you had asked me if kids were watching it when it was originally on HBO with all the nudity and the language and the gore and everything, uh-huh. I'd be like, no. Way, but I was wrong. <laughs> you know, I was completely wrong. They, they were all watching it. Yeah, I was. I was actually nine when it premiered. And uh, oh. I, I, here's my story, though. I was terrified of the Crypt Keeper. I remember there's two things I was afraid of as a kid. The first thing was Robert Stack's voice from Unsolved Mysteries. I was terrified <laughs> when I heard his voice. And the second thing was the Crypt Keeper. So That's you terrified great. me for at least a good couple of years. I think I started watching it. I want to say when I was maybe 11 or 12. Perfect. So it would have been like 91, 92-ish. Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter, Brooklyn, was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. What if I told you that a tornado was going to happen tomorrow right where you live? That it would touch down at exactly 3.17 p.m. and I told you the exact path it would take. You would, of course, prepare. You would talk with your loved ones, and you'd make a plan today. It's true. I can't tell you a tornado will strike tomorrow. But shouldn't you have a plan anyway? Go to ready.gov slash communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores. And at 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com, brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires.
My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. (laughs) Hey, everyone. Let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments. It doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. funny how certain kids just immediately know when something has kind of like a tongue-in-cheek aspect to it and other kids are just like terrified of it yeah you know i think my mom is the one that made me scared because i remember the first time i saw your character on tv where we're sitting in the living room and a commercial came on or something came on with the crib keeper and she like jumped up with a blanket and just like covered the tv so i wouldn't see it that's first <laughs> my first exposure to your character <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, I mean, that's how people reacted to the comic book back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, exactly. You know, the reason there are, you know, ratings on comic books is because of the tales from the EC comics that William Gaines had put out there, including Tales from the Crypt. And, um, but it's funny. I get all kinds of stories from it's the only show that my whole family sat down and watched together. Wow. To my parents would punish me and make me watch it if I was bad. <laughs> to my parents wouldn't let me watch it if I was bad. To, um, you know, my parents wouldn't let me watch it, but I spent weekends with my grandma, so we watched it together. Um, I mean, I get all these stories and, you know, people watched it, and, and a lot of the people were like, this is what introduced me to horror. This was what got me into horror. And, you know, your voice, yeah, you know, sometimes I couldn't watch it, but I'd listen to your voice in the background, and it would just, you know. And, you know, obviously a lot of people did a lot of great work on that show. Oh, yeah. They got a lot of favors. It was a very expensive show to do, which is probably why it's not been put, it wasn't back on the air, yeah. uh, you know, uh, yet. Um, and... You know, they got a lot of favors. They got a lot of stars. You had the biggest producers in Hollywood producing it, so they could get a lot of favors. And, um, you know, they just, they just really went way out of their way to make sure that it, that it had stories out of the comic book, was shot like the frames of, the, of what it looked like in the comic book. You know, they got great directors, great actors. And the whole deal, but I'm I'm kind of like one of the ones that get to enjoy the benefits of it, uh, of the the memory of it because I was the pitch man. Yeah. I was the guy that made it different from the other anthologies. You know, the Crypt Keeper was, you know, I mean, Tales from the Crypt was like a roller coaster ride, and the Crypt Keeper was kind of like the the ride up to the top before it drops you down. You know. And so um, he had that kind of titillating aspect to it and let you know that this was supposed to be fun and that you were going to have a good time and you could laugh at it. And, and you know, um, even if it scared you, it was still for fun. You know, that this is this was a, um, a titillating candy bar, if you will. But, um, you know, they, don't, they didn't keep the rights because they never, I don't think they realized that there was an audience that was that it had gained uh, from many years ago that were now old enough to to want it, you know, to pay for it to be yeah. on TV. So you know the rights were sold by the Gaines family to TNT, and uh, this version they want to do with M Night Shyamalan, which won't include or can't inc- include um, me or the Crypt Keeper that I voiced because that was created specifically for our version. Wow. You know, it was, it was uh, you know, um, unless they were willing to license it to them or something, which I don't think they would be, you know, because I'm sure they'd love to have the show back, you know, the licensing back yeah. to put it on the air. But, um, 
you know, I'm I'm just a uh, you know a part of it, but you know, uh, I'm, a lot of the fan base and people associate me as Tales from the Crypt, which is kind of fun. You know, I mean, it's not something they ever bargained for. You know, I've, I've, I was, even after winning Star Search, I was kind of even though I knew that you know and enjoyed a certain amount of celebrity because I knew it was important to getting work. Um, it wasn't something that I worked that hard at, you know, I mean, we didn't really have social media back then. You had to hire publicists and mm-hmm. they were very expensive and that kind of thing. And I just, you know, was happy to, to continue to work and make my, you know, a, a really nice living as an actor. And then of course, as you get older, you realize it's like, okay, how, why did I just lose that part to Scott Bayo? Okay. Well, cause he was on a, he's better known than I am. You know, it's like, that's that's fine, and Scott Bayo's great, and, you know, he should get parts and that kind of thing, but it's like, you know, come on. Um, but that's that's just the way it works. Now, of course, social media has, you know, any project that I do, you know, I wind up having to, you know, I feel like I bore people by putting my stuff up on social media, but the fact is, is you're your own Nielsen ratings now. You have to do it. Exactly. They expect you to do it. Yep. Some of the projects that I worked on have it in your contract. They expect you to be tweeting and, you know, putting it on social media and that kind of thing. And the fan base is really generous about being involved and and they enjoy sharing the ride with you. You know, right now, um, as we're recording this, uh, um, uh, some uh, the audience may remember that I, I would have just have done uh, Pete's Dragon. Yes, as the yes. voice of uh, Elliot the Dragon. And, um, you know, and it's such a beautiful film. I'm so happy, so happy and proud to be on it out of, you know, cause you get, you know, over your career, you do a lot of good, good stuff, but most of it's crap. <laughs> Just the nature of, <laughs> you know, what gets made. And, um, so when you're attached to something that's really wonderful, you, you know, you put it out there and people have been going in droves to go see it, you know, that know me and, and, uh, or, or fans and that kind of thing. And, sending me great comments about how much they love the movie and about how great it is and and uh, that kind of thing. So I get to actually share it with a bunch of people that I know and a bunch of people that I don't know who are kind of like my social media friends. And um, so I enjoy that aspect of it. It's a little different than, you know, um, past years when I, you know, when I was younger and that was probably the meat and potatoes and the salad days of, well, more the salad days of my uh my youth, my, um, you know, my career where I was working like nonstop in so many different projects and, um, you know, didn't even have time to promote them. I just had time to shoot them and do them, you know. Now, tell me about your version of Elliot in the uh, New Pete's Dragon. What approach did you take on giving him the voice he has? Um, you know, I had to take the approach off of what they had created because, um, very often, like when I did the voice of Miko the Raccoon and Pocahontas and that kind of thing, you, you're really going off of storyboards and the director and the, you know, the creators and that kind of thing, the information that you're, you're giving them and you're creating <coughs> this, um, uh, you know, you're creating this, you know, raccoon in the, in, uh, with the idea of, you know, they're talking you through it. Okay, he's running, he goes into a log, he comes out of the log, he looks down and he's over a body of water as he's going down halfway. He's fighting his way down. Then he realizes, oh, this water's going to be fine. He goes into a swan dive. He pops, you know, and you start, he spits water out. You know, you do the, you do this as uh, as an actor in a room and they're, shoot, you'll be, they're even shooting video of you so they can see how you're moving and that kind of thing mm-hmm. to incorporate in it. But in the case of something like Peach Dragon where they've, you know, these uh, incredible animators have... Um, made this uh, beautiful dragon that marries really well with the live action of the movie. Um, I had the luxury of, of going in and seeing what they had done. Uh, it wasn't all finished, but a lot of it was. And so I had to create sounds and emotions and try to bring to life the vocal aspects of a, uh, what was already physically realized um, on screen. So I got to work a lot with the editor as well as, the, you know, David Lowry, who was the director, but um, a lot with the editor who knew what she needed to fill every moment to make the character relate to the little boy who had, you know, who was probably playing to a tennis ball on a pole at the time mm-hmm. when he shot it. And so you have to 
bring this other element to it that brings the actual, you know, animated dragon that wasn't there while the kid was shooting it, relating to the way the kid was acting as well. So, um, you know, almost bringing some human qualities to some animal kind of noises. Um, so when we first started doing it, I was trying to do some big sounds because, you know, it was a 20, 25 foot creature, um, in the reality of the movie. And, um, and then I realized, you know, so over the, the years of doing ga- ga- you know, interactive games and that kind of thing where I do a lot of animals and voices and creatures and that kind of thing that, you know, when you try to go low with your voice, you know, there, it kind of flattens out. You don't have as much variety to it. So, uh, my idea was to do it in my own vocal range and have them lower it and add bass to it to, to bring it to the size of the dragon. Cause there's no way I could have, any human could have done that, uh, vocally so that I could bring a lot more musicality and variety and emotion to the voice. So it was fun. I get, you know, some of the stuff that I did was low. Some of the stuff that I did was high, but then when they, you know, married it to the picture and added, uh, you know, the, the beauty of, uh, you know, whatever kind of sound system they used, Dolby or whatever it was, um, to it, it really, uh, I mean, it's really kind of earth shattering, you know, it's really kind of cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, plus it, it was able to really bring across, you know, the emotion and the, and the feel of what I got to do. So, you know, what was, what started out as a, you know, as a little, um, session or two turned into, uh, you know, 10, 12 sessions, uh, you know, um, in this, on the sound stage, um, giving them as many different versions of what I could do with it as possible so that they could choose from it and add to it and use it in other places and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it was, it, it was, it was technical, but also a lot of emotional and physical work to bring it across Mm -hmm. and it it really came across great. They did such a beautiful job crafting this movie. You know, it's, it has the feel of a, of um you know an instant classic disney movie but at the same time like as a you know if you brought a parent brought their kid to it they wouldn't be sitting there going okay when is this movie going to be over you know my kid's enjoying it and loving it but you know what about me movies for everybody you know it's it's funny one of of my fans wrote is like okay so uh i was had a really hard time not crying in the uh touching moments and that kind of thing my 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 child was bawling and then i looked over to my buddy who's really macho sitting next to me on the left and he was he had his handkerchief i was weeping (laughs) i was like that's perfect right you know and he goes and we laughed through it we cried through it and the whole thing and the relationship between he and pete were really great and all that stuff and that's Really, that's all you can ask for when yeah. you're trying to make a good movie is for people to take the ride and believe it, what they're watching. You know, if if they're in and out of it, then you've not done your job. If they're in it and they're believing it. And, and the other things I loved about this movie, um, having shot it in New Zealand, uh, where they made it look like, you know, the uh, Pacific Northwest here in the United States, um, was really great to shoot it on locations instead of making it look like, um, a bunch of CGI backgrounds and that kind of thing. Yeah, I completely um, agree with that. Yeah, I mean now they're able to bring make the dragon look so real with with natural backgrounds that they don't have to, you know, put unnatural backgrounds to make the the creature that's forward look real. It was pretty amazing. When I worked on Jack the Giant Slayer, it was, uh, you know, I mean I was amazed by what they did, um, bringing these giants to life, and that was all mocap. So we, you know, we were in those those funny suits with uh-huh. spots all over our face and stuff. And I mean, that's hard work. That's that was a lot of fun work. I mean, I got to work with Bill Nye, you know, which is you uh, know, a wonderful British actor. Wow, yeah. We're like Bill Nye, the science guy. <laughs> like, no, not Bill Nye, the science guy. <laughs> Bill Nye the, from you know Love Actually and all the, <laughs> all these great movies. You know, this incredible British actor. You know, playing these two headed giant together. And um, we had an amazing time in these ridiculous suits, but we had a lot of fun uh, bringing that to life. And it's a very expensive process for them to bring entire an entire world and all those creatures to life. Um, you know, it took them a year of uh, you know work and um, of intricate work and and uh, you know a two hundred million dollar budget to realize an entire world <clears throat> um, that has 
real locations married to fake location, you know, CGI locations to with real characters and CGI characters. It's that's no small feat. It takes like a you know a great director like Brian Singer to bring that to life and to um, you know have an incredible team of people with a lot of money to make that you know come to life. And you can make that as real as you want to make it if you have the money to do it. At mm-hmm. some point, you just can't spend any more money on it. You know, in certain parts of it, you're like, oh, that didn't quite look finished. You know, <laughs> um, not that that movie had that, but a lot, you know, I've seen that in some of the movies. But this movie was done on location with a $66 million budget, which sounds like a lot of money, but it, in comparison, not. Yeah, nowadays um, it's not. Yeah. And uh, David Lowry, who comes from independent filmmaking, you know, bringing such a personal touch to it. So I was, I was pretty proud to work on that. And I, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, putting, putting it out there for people to come see it and, and wanting people to see it just because I, I, I knew that they would enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Dear John, I'm leaving. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is serious, and I can quit whenever I want. Why can't we get back to when you checked on me? I don't want to leave. But remember, when I quit, you quit. Sincerely, your heart. Listen to your heart and don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range today. For help keeping yours at a healthy range, text PRESSURE to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio, take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome to Calvin's Barbershop. You all got to see this. I don't even want to know what you're looking at on that phone. Well, you should. I was learning about the dangers of high blood pressure and that we need to get ours checked regularly. High blood pressure can increase the risk of heart attack or stroke, but this text program can help keep it at a healthy range. Just text Barbershop to 97779 to sign up. I'll get right on it as soon as I'm done with this baby panda video. (laughs) Text Barbershop to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association and the Ad Council. Oh, my precious. Ooh, yeah, let me tell you something right here, uh uh-huh. It's the Loot Crate subscription box, yeah, full of exclusive loot. Fun surprises delivered to your door every month. Just pick up your favorite geeky genre, daddy. Ha <laughs> ha! From the original Loot Crate, the Loot Crate DX collectible boxes, dude! Cowabunga! To the Loot Gaming video game box. Woohoo! Browsers! With crates starting as low as $11.99 per month, those are backs just about for all collectors. To get your geek on, head over to phoenixmedia.us forward slash loot crate and claim your exclusive offer. That's F E N I X media.us forward slash loot crate. Great Scott! Snap into a loot crate, dig it! You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Now, I wanted to close real quick. On in 1993, they created the animated series Tales from the Crypt Keeper. What are your thoughts about that process? Were you kind of skeptical when they announced they're going to make it a kid's version of it? Well, you know, it's funny because I had been saying to them that they should do a live-action kid's version, you know, where nobody dies, but it's, you know, 
I said, look, you know, kids, I love this stuff as a kid. I, and the comic books were originally for kids. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you can make a kid's version of this, you know, with a Crypt Keeper and, um, you know, he introduces and the, and the actors in it are kids and that kind of thing. And they're like, nah, too scary. They won't let us do it. They'd never let us do it, blah, 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 blah. You know, and they go, okay, well, we're going to do a cartoon version of it. Um, and, you know, of course, I came in the studio and they wanted me to tone it down, you know, because they were afraid of scaring kids, you know, they wanted to appeal to kids that wanted to watch it but weren't afraid of it. But, you know, like we were saying earlier, there's those kids that are afraid and then there's, there's kids that, you know, get the, the comedy of mm-hmm. it. And, you know, the animation and the colors were very different than what you'd, you know, would have seen. Of course, I grew up on Merry Melody and, and Looney Tune cartoons, which yes. were so fluid and that kind of thing in this this had more of the feel of a Scooby-Doo uh, kind of thing, which I loved. But at the same time, you know, being a fan of animation, there's just, again, it's, it's, it takes a lot of money to make those fluid kind of cartoons as opposed to this. But the, you know, the marriage of colors and, and the way that they drew the characters, like a comic book and that kind of thing, made it really special. And um, so it was, you know, we did them fast. It was fun to do, but at the same time, it, it was kind of like, a held back version of the Crypt Keeper and a held back version of what they were doing. And then of course, <clears throat> television came out with R.L. Stein's Goosebumps, you yeah. know, which was a live yeah. action version. <laughs> yep. I was going to say that it's just like it's a kid's version of it. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah. And I was like, I told you, you guys did <laughs> both. I told you, and, you know, but they, they swear that they, the Crypt Keeper himself just would have been too scary for kids, you know, Perhaps. but um, <clears throat> here you and I know, all these years later with all the fan base that are now, um, you know, anywhere from their, from, uh, 20 to, you know, uh, 50 that were, you know, teenagers, adults, kids, you know, whatever, um, uh, that fan base plus the fan base that were adults at the time yep. that they're all really passionate about it. And that the Crypt Keeper is, you know, there's little kids that came up to me and there, I mean, you know, Adults now that came up to me and said when they were a little kid, you know, you know, the girl would say, you know, my family teased me because I used to say the Crypt Keeper was my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Have I got a b- for her? <laughs> oh, man, I love that. So do you have anything you want to promote, like any Twitter or Facebook or anything? Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm on, uh, Twitter under John Kassir, J-O-H-N-K-A-S-S-I-R, and also on Facebook as John Kassir, uh, J-O-H-N-K-A-S-S-I-R. I'm on Instagram with the same name. And, um, uh, you know, I, uh, Facebook, uh, I see everything that comes on there. Um, I have, you know, I have my full 5,000 people, so, but you can still follow me and, and you'll get all my posts and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, as people drop out, I add other people, that kind of thing. But uh, nice. they don't, unfortunately, don't give you the ability to, to add everybody. Yeah. I got a couple thousand people that have wanted that, to become friends with me on Facebook. I should I should do another fan page as well where they can just um, also follow. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just, I'm, you know, it's like I'm not very tech savvy and to spend my time doing that is, is uh, I'm, instead I'm trying to do as many good projects as I can for the fans to enjoy. Um, and, but sooner or later I'll get around to it. In the meantime, just follow me there and, uh, and get in touch with me on, uh, Facebook or Twitter or send me some cool photographs on Instagram. John, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a huge honor. Big fan of your work. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Yeah. Can I have you close the episode out as the Crypt Keeper? Hello, kitties. This is John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. And you're listening to Tim Nidell on Saturday Morning Rewind. <laughs> Rewind. Thanks for listening to Saturday Morning Rewind. Please check them out on Facebook and Twitter. And that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs>